The Grand Mosque seizure occurred during November and December 1979 when insurgents calling for the overthrow of the House of Saud took over Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. The insurgents declared that the Mahdi the Redeemer of Islam had arrived in the form of one of their leaders, Muhammad Abdullah al Qahtani, and called on Muslims to obey him. For nearly two weeks, Saudi special forces, assisted by Pakistani and French commandos, fought battles to reclaim the compound. The seizure of Islam's holiest site, the taking of hostages from among the worshippers, and the deaths of hundreds of militants, security forces, and hostages caught in the crossfire in the ensuing battles for control of the site shocked the Islamic world. The siege ended two weeks after the takeover began and the mosque was cleared. al Qahtani was killed in the recapture of the mosque but Juhayman and 67 of his fellow rebels who survived the assault were captured and later beheaded. Following the attack, the Saudi king Khalid implemented a stricter enforcement of Sharia Islamic law. He gave the ulama and religious conservatives more power over the next decade, and religious police became more assertive. Topic. Background. The seizure was led by Juhayman al Otaybi, a member of an influential family in Najd. He declared his brother in law Muhammad Abdullah al Qahtani to be the Mahdi, or Redeemer, who arrives on earth several years before Judgment Day. His followers embellished the fact that al Qahtani's name and his father's name are identical to Prophet Muhammad's name and that of his father, and developed a saying, His and his father's names were the same as Muhammad's and his father's, and he had come to Makkah from the north to justify their belief. The date of the attack, 20 November 1979, was the first day of the year 1400 according to the Islamic calendar. This ties in with the tradition of the Mujadid, a person who appears at the turn of every century of the Islamic calendar to revive Islam, cleansing it of extraneous elements and restoring it to its pristine purity. al Otaybi was from one of the foremost families of Najd. His grandfather had ridden with Ibn Saud in the early decades of the century and other of his family members were among foremost of the Ikhwan. He was a preacher, a former corporal in the Saudi National Guard and a former student of Sheikh Abdul Aziz al-Baz who went on to become the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> Goals al Otaybi had turned against al-Baz and began advocating a return to the original ways of Islam, among other things, a repudiation of the West, abolition of television and expulsion of non-Muslims." He proclaimed that, "...the ruling al-Saud dynasty had lost its legitimacy because it was corrupt, ostentatious and had destroyed Saudi culture by an aggressive policy of westernization." al Otaybi and Qatani had met while imprisoned together for sedition, when al Otaybi claimed to have had a vision sent by God telling him that Qatani was the Mahdi. Their declared goal was to institute a theocracy in preparation for the imminent apocalypse. They differed from the original Ikhwan and other earlier Wahhabi purists in that, they were millenarians, they rejected the monarchy and condemned the Wahhabi ulama. <laughs> Relations with ulama Many of their followers were drawn from theology students at the Islamic University in Medina. al Otaybi joined the local chapter of the Salafi group al jama al Salafiya al Mudasiba, the Salafi group that commands right and forbids wrong, in Medina, headed by renowned Sheikh Abd al Aziz ibn Baz, chairman of the Permanent Committee for Islamic Research and issuing fatwas at the time. The followers preached their radical message in different mosques in Saudi Arabia without being arrested. The government was reluctant to confront religious extremists. When al Otaybi, al Qahtani, and a number of the Ikhwan were locked up as troublemakers by the Ministry of Interior Security Police in 1978, members of the ulama including bin Baz cross examined them for heresy, but they were subsequently released as being traditionalists hearkening back to the Ikhwan, like al Otaybi's grandfather, and, therefore, not a threat. Even after the seizure of the Grand Mosque, a certain level of forbearance by ulama for the rebels remained. When the government asked for a fatwa allowing armed force in the Grand Mosque, the language of bin Baz and other senior ulama was curiously restrained. The scholars did not declare al Otaybi and his followers non Muslims, despite their violation of the sanctity of the Grand Mosque, but only termed them al Jama al Musalaha, the armed group. 
The senior scholars also insisted that before security forces attack them, the authorities must offer them the option to surrender. Topic. Preparations Because of donations from wealthy followers, the group was well armed and trained. Some members, like al Otebi, were former military officials of the National Guard. Some National Guard troops sympathetic to the insurgents smuggled weapons, ammunition, gas masks and provisions into the mosque compound over a period of weeks before the New Year. Automatic weapons were smuggled from National Guard armories and the supplies were hidden in the hundreds of tiny underground rooms under the mosque that were used as hermitages. Seizure In the early morning of 20 November 1979, the Imam of the Grand Mosque, Sheikh Muhammad al Subail, was preparing to lead prayers for the 50,000 worshippers who had gathered for prayer. At around 5 a.m. he was interrupted by insurgents who produced weapons from under their robes, chained the gates shut and killed two policemen who were armed with only wooden clubs for disciplining unruly pilgrims. The number of insurgents has been given as, at least 500, or, 4 to 500, and included several women and children who had joined al Otebi's movement, at the time the Grand Mosque was being renovated by the Saudi Bin Laden group. An employee of the organization was able to report the seizure to the outside world before the insurgents cut the telephone lines. The insurgents released most of the hostages and locked the remainder in the sanctuary. They took defensive positions in the upper levels of the mosque, and sniper positions in the minarets, from which they commanded the grounds. No one outside the mosque knew how many hostages remained, how many militants were in the mosque and what sort of preparations they had made. At the time of the event, Crown Prince Fahd was in Tunisia for a meeting of the Arab summit. The commander of the National Guard, Prince Abdullah, was also abroad for an official visit to Morocco. Therefore, King Khalid assigned the responsibility to the Sudairi brothers, Prince Sultan, then Minister of Defense, and Prince Nayef, then Minister of Interior, to deal with the incident. Topic. Siege Soon after the rebel seizure, about 100 security officers of the Ministry of Interior attempted to retake the mosque, but were turned back with heavy casualties. The survivors were quickly joined by units of the Saudi Arabian Army and Saudi Arabian National Guard. At the request of the Saudi monarchy, the Pakistani military's special forces and French Gigan units, operatives and commandos were rushed to assist Saudi forces in Mecca to lead the operation to recapture the Grand Mosque. By evening the entire city of Mecca had been evacuated. Prince Sultan appointed Turki bin Faisal al Saud, head of the al Muqabarat al Amma Saudi intelligence, to take over the forward command post several hundred meters from the mosque, where Prince Turki would remain for the next several weeks. However, the first order of business was to seek the approval of the ulema, which was led by Abdul Aziz bin Baz. Islam forbids any violence within the Grand Mosque, to the extent that plants cannot be uprooted without explicit religious sanction. Ibn Baz found himself in a delicate situation, especially as he had previously taught al Otebi in Medina. Regardless, the ulema issued a fatwa allowing deadly force to be used in retaking the mosque. With religious approval granted, Saudi forces launched frontal assaults on three of the main gates. Again, the assaulting force was repulsed as they were unable to break through the insurgents' defenses. Snipers continued to pick off soldiers who revealed themselves. The insurgents aired their demands from the mosque's loudspeakers throughout the streets of Mecca, calling for the cutoff of oil exports to the United States and the expulsion of all foreign civilian and military experts from the Arabian Peninsula. In Beirut an opposition organization the Arab Socialist Action Party, Arabian Peninsula issued a statement on 25 November, alleging to clarify the demands of the insurgents. The party, however, denied any involvement in the seizure of the Grand Mosque. Officially, the Saudi government took the position that it would not aggressively retake the mosque, but rather starve out the militants. Nevertheless, several unsuccessful assaults were undertaken, at least one of them through the underground tunnels in and around the mosque. According to Lawrence Wright in the book The Looming Tower, Al Qaeda and the Road to 9 11, a team of three French commandos from the Groupe d'Intervention de la Gendarmerie Nationale Gigan arrived in Mecca. Because of the prohibition against non-Muslims entering the holy city, they converted to Islam in a brief, formal ceremony. 
The commandos pumped gas into the underground chambers, but perhaps because the rooms were so bafflingly interconnected, the gas failed and the resistance continued. With casualties climbing, Saudi forces drilled holes into the courtyard and dropped grenades into the rooms below, indiscriminately killing many hostages but driving the remaining rebels into more open areas where they could be picked off by sharpshooters. More than two weeks after the assault began, the surviving rebels finally surrendered. However, this account is contradicted by at least two other accounts, including that of then Gigan commanding officer Christian Prouto. The three Gigan commandos trained and equipped the Saudi forces and devised their attack plan, which consisted of drilling holes in the floor of the mosque and firing gas canisters wired with explosives through the perforations, but did not take part in the action and did not set foot in the mosque. He claims that Pakistani SSG commandos carried out the operation instead. The Saudi National Guard and the Saudi Army suffered heavy casualties. Tear gas was used to force out the remaining militants. According to a U.S. embassy cable of 1 December, several of the militant leaders escaped the siege and days later sporadic fighting erupted in other parts of the city. The battle had lasted for more than two weeks, and had officially left 255 pilgrims, troops and fanatics killed and another 560 injured although diplomats suggested the toll was higher." Military casualties were 127 dead and 451 injured. Aftermath Prisoners, trials and executions Shortly after news of the takeover was released, the new Islamic revolutionary leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, told radio listeners, "...it is not beyond guessing that this is the work of criminal American imperialism and international Zionism." Anger fueled by these rumors spread anti-American demonstrations throughout the Muslim world—in the Philippines, Turkey, Bangladesh, eastern Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Pakistan. In Islamabad, Pakistan, on the day following the takeover, the U.S. embassy in that city was overrun by a mob, which burned the embassy to the ground. A week later, in Tripoli, Libya, another mob attacked and burned the U.S. embassy. al Qahtani was killed in the recapture of the mosque but Juhayman and 67 of his fellow rebels who survived the assault were captured and later beheaded. They were not shown leniency. The king secured a fatwa edict from the Council of Senior Scholars which found the defendants guilty of seven crimes Violating the Masjid al-Haram's sanctity Violating the sanctity of the month of Muharram Killing fellow Muslims and others Disobeying legitimate authorities Suspending prayer at Masjid al-Haram Erring in identifying the Mahdi Exploiting the innocent for criminal acts. On 9 January 1980, 63 rebels were publicly beheaded in the squares of eight Saudi cities Baraita, Dammam, Mecca, Medina, Riyadh, Abba, Hayal, and Tabak. According to Sandra Mackey, the locations were carefully chosen not only to give maximum exposure but, one suspects, to reach other potential nests of discontent. Policies <laughs> <laughs> Saudi King Khalid, however, did not react to the upheaval by cracking down on religious Puritans in general, but by giving the ulama and religious conservatives more power over the next decade. He is thought to have believed that, "...the solution to the religious upheaval was simple, more religion." First, photographs of women in newspapers were banned, then women on television. Cinemas and music shops were shut down. School curriculum was changed to provide many more hours of religious studies, eliminating classes on subjects like non-Islamic history. Gender segregation was extended to the humblest coffee shop, and religious police became more assertive. However, the Saudi government has made incremental reforms toward a more tolerant society decades after the uprisings. Thirty years after the revolts in Mecca, by 2009, the power of the religious police had been reduced. In 2017, the Saudi government announced that women will no longer be prohibited from driving because of their gender, and in December 2017, the licensing of cinemas was announced to be resumed again in 2018, ending nearly a 35 year ban. See also 
Operation Blue Star, Golden Temple, Amritsar, India, 1984 Siege of Lal Masjid People claiming to be the Mahdi Masjid al-Haram Grand Mosque Ikhwan Revolt List of modern conflicts in the Middle East Special Services Group of Pakistan Memali Incident Waco Siege Topic. Notes Topic. Further reading Aburish, Said K., The Rise, Corruption, and Coming Fall of the House of Saud, St. Martins 1996. Benjamin, Daniel, The Age of Sacred Terror by Daniel Benjamin and Stephen Simon, New York, Random House, C. 2002 Fair, C. Christine and Sumit Ganguly, "...treading on hallowed ground, counterinsurgency operations in sacred spaces." Oxford University Press, 2008 Hasner, Ron E. War on Sacred Grounds. Cornell University Press, 2009. ISBN 978-0-8014-4806-5. Kechichian, Joseph A. The Role of the Ulama in the Politics of an Islamic State: The Case of Saudi Arabia. International Journal of Middle East Studies, 18, 1986, 53 to 71. Trofimov, Yaroslav, The Siege of Mecca, The Forgotten Uprising in Islam's Holiest Shrine and the Birth of Al-Qaeda, Doubleday 2007, ISBN 0-385-51925-7 also softcover, Anchor, ISBN 0-307-27773-9 Wright, Robin B. Sacred Rage, The Wrath of Militant Islam, Simon & Schuster 2001, Wright, Lawrence, The Looming Tower, Al-Qaeda and the Road to 9-11, New York, Knopf 2006, ISBN 978-0-375-41486-2 also softcover, New York, Vintage, ISBN 978-1-4000-3084-2